This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Right now, today, the day after, the day before, six months from now, a year from now, the question is, where will we be here in America, the USA, and how will that impact and affect all the nations on planet Earth? And what we see unfolding before our very eyes is a a series of very disturbing scenarios. Now, despite the fact that we see these disturbing scenarios, it does not absolve anyone from not participating in the political process by being informed, by voting, by knowing what the issues are, by knowing what the candidates stand for, by being able to contrast what the candidates stand for and what the, what the Bible calls for. Probably 97% of the church has no idea what the Bible calls for in terms of voting and civic responsibility. In addition to that, we live in a, in, in a time period where, where there is a mass insanity that grips the American people, a mass insanity that is so distorted. Let I me mean, just think about this for a moment. If you've been alive for more than 10 years, or 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, however old you are, the very idea that we would have a candidate running, it has nothing to do with whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. It has to do with the issue of sanity and mental health and cognitive uh, functions. We have a candidate running for president um, who is so uh, lacking and so degraded in in his cognitive abilities, that he cannot remember things, he can't put two and two together, he he mixes up what he's saying 180 degrees, and he can't put together a coherent argument unless he's coached with a teleprompter and somebody speaking to him in an ear uh, device. In addition to that, Although you can't prove it, the, the, the obvious nature of his cognitive display when he's giving a speech, you know, carefully managed, micromanaged speech, he can seem to uh, keep that together. But then there's horrible glitches in his statements. And so they jack him up with whatever smart drug cocktail that they're using. And that keeps him flying high uh, and able to to masquerade like he's all there. But the the bottom line is he's not all there. Anyone who's been around or has had to take care of someone with Alzheimer's or dementia or whatever, as I have, as many of you have, the the symptoms are obvious. You, You have to be brain dead yourself. And I don't mean that in an unkind way. But you have to be brain dead yourself not to miss the obvious symptoms of the stages of serious cognitive decline. So how on earth can you have a man uh, who would be president of the United States who simply does not have the mental capabilities to make decisions of any kind and is nothing more than a neurological puppet doped up with various injections? That will keep him in a, some kind of a status quo mode for, for you know, 40 minutes or whatever. But you notice when they videotape him and they're not in total control of the little production they're creating, he says the most insane, irrational things. Now, whatever you like or dislike about Donald Trump, you can't say that he's in cognitive decline. You can say, I don't like his policies. Uh, I don't like this, I don't like that, that's fine. But you can't say he's in cognitive decline, because it's obvious he isn't. So the question is, how can a nation put forth a presidential candidate who's not all there in the brain? I mean, this is a serious thing. Well, they know he's not all there in the brain. He is simply the dog and pony show that's being displayed to appeal to what could be called the moron vote. The moron vote is is what we call uh, 
behind the scenes in the film business, we call it the low bandwidth voter. The low bandwidth voter is a voter who, in terms of bandwidth, electromagnetic frequency spectrum, has um, a very uh, tiny bits of information flowing in his or her consciousness. They're low bandwidth voters. It's like their brains are not equipped with the technology to process a lot of information. Information like adequate perception. Information like noticing the obvious that the guy's not all there. Noticing the obvious that he he bumps his sentences together like two uh, Amtrak trains speeding at 80 miles per hour, and they're going to go into a head-on collision. I've been in, in trains. Not that have been in head-on collisions, but missed my train, which was in a head-on collision. It's a disaster. People get killed. The trains flip from the from the railways. Why is it that the American can't be the American people can't see the obvious? It's obvious. This is a dog and pony show, and that the real powers behind the throne will be these other politicians, like the vice presidential candidate and other politicians whose plans this puppet president, or could say more accurate, this Manchurian candidate that they're promoting. Because he can't run. He's neurologically incapable of running anything. He couldn't run a donut store. Okay, He does not have the cognitive ability to, to... bake a rack of donuts in a donut store and serve, you know, instant coffee. I mean, how is he going to run the most powerful economy and the most powerful military nation? How is he going to really solve a COVID crisis? And then you have the Hollywood puppets. The, the, the Hollywood puppets are the chorus from hell. Uh, they sing the same script, the same politically correct script on cue whenever they're asked to, because that's the secret exchange they've made for their elevation and power, fame, claim, that somehow they're more knowledgeable than the rest of us, that they have more insight, when in actuality, the opposite is true. So this is a very uh, serious state of affairs. That, and you see the product of our educational system Dumbed down millennials, dumbed down uh, adults of various age categories who don't even know the most minimal basics of history and economics and social structures, et cetera, et cetera, who champion co- communism, but they can't define it, who promote Marxism, but they can't compare and contrast Marxism with capitalism. And, and not to mention the fact, the historical fact that every Marxist, socialist, communist government that has ever been put into operation always, without exception, enslaves the masses, takes away all their freedoms, takes away uh, any possibility of redistribution of wealth, does not allow you to pursue a dream of any kind, and you're basically a slave in a totalitarian slave state. That is the outcome or the end game of a communist totalitarian uh, government. And that's what they want. That's what they want. I mean, if you had like like the brain of a pea, if you were to take a tweezers and pull a pea out of a bowl of pea soup, and that represented the totality of your cognitive ability, then it would be impossible for you to understand the fact that if you're going to increase taxes uh, upon the American people, the American middle class, the American working class, if you're going to add to their taxation uh, a total of over a trillion dollars, okay, the first year you're in, you're going to spend a trillion dollars of new taxes on the middle class and the working class. Any honest economist knows that that's like slamming the brakes in a car traveling 90 miles an hour. 
the economy was traveling at 90 miles an hour. And the data shows that we saw the greatest increases in not only working class Americans of all races, middle class Americans of all races, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, all enjoyed the greatest pay increases, the greatest rebound in our economy, our standard of living, going back for decades and decades. And every time there's been a replication of this strategy, which is raise taxes and redistribute the wealth, it always results in a crashing of the economy. It always results, without exception, you know, it's very, you know, it's like if you're high on drugs and you can't make a, a sober, sane analysis, you're going to get into a crash collision. If you don't understand the basic basis of all economics, which is if you, if you continually raise the taxes on the middle class and the working class, that leaves them with no income to spend to invest in building their own businesses, hiring employees who get paid in their own businesses, developing family businesses, developing wealth, creating wealth. All of this combined synergistically creates a booming economy. When you tax people, you deplete from the people the cash available, the money available that they have to spend uh, that could cause an economic recovery. Notice how many of the big African-American hip-hop stars, rappers like 50 Cent, and there's others, who have said they were going to vote for Trump, and probably still are, but they can't say anything about it. These are people that sell millions of albums of their of their songs, but they can't openly speak in this culture that we live in. They can't openly speak about the fact that they're going to vote for Trump because they will be censored and attacked uh, by other people in the African American. But they have become entrepreneurs through the sales of their music. They've become entrepreneurs, generating a lot of money. They've become multimillionaires, in some cases billionaires. But they can't tell anyone, because if they do, there are people within their own ranks that will attack them. Now, so what, what, what does all this mean? We are right now at the tipping point, just looking at it economically. If we go down the road, into higher taxation, more micromanagement by bureaucracies, we're going to self-destruct. Because along with more taxation and more micromanagement from uh, bureaucracies, what always goes along with that is oppression, excessive regulation, totalitarianism, uh, lack of freedom of speech, lack of freedom of religion, uh, freedom of uh, expression, freedom of thought, all of those things are lost in totalitarian regimes. So we have now the largest group of dumbed-down Americans, and that includes white people of various age groups, African Americans, Hispanics, it includes an entire spectrum of racial and ethnic groups because they all have a commonality. Most people went to uh, public education and they were put through a social engineering process, a social indoctrination process, which put them through a, a rapid cognitive decline. In other words, the real purpose of education, according to, to educational experts that I've quoted in my book, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. I quote the heads of the NEA, National Education Association, and others, who said openly 40 years ago, they said these words, the real purpose of education is not to educate, it's to indoctrinate. So the, the whole paradigm of the way we so-called educate our children, that entire paradigm is like putting our our children through a mine factory 
which neurologically rewires them to be stupid. They suffer cognitive decline, except it's cognitive decline produced by social engineering education versus cognitive decline produced by uh, aging, in Biden's case or whatever, because he has serious cognitive decline. But we have tens of millions of people of voting age now who also have a different kind of cognitive decline. It, it, it's, it's subtle. It's more subtle because it doesn't show up in, in people speaking in garbled language. But nevertheless, this cognitive decline is measurable because when you have your average millennial or the overwhelming percentage of millennial students who can't tell you the difference, who boldly and aggressively call for America to become a communist, socialist, Marxist state. But when they're examined by reputable pollsters, they cannot tell you or define for you what a communist state is or a socialist Marxist state is. They have no ability to give you a definitive contrasting between a communist state and a capitalist state. So they're programmed to to simply accept what they were uh, engineered to produce, which is to be compliant and to be low bandwidth voters and to be low bandwidth people. And tragically, notice percentile wise how many Christians, how many evangelical Christians would fall into the category of being cognitively challenged and of being low band low bandwidth voters because they don't have the knowledge they don't have the power they don't have the education to look at life reality voting elections economics through the lens of ultimate truth which is a biblical worldview and that is the fault of <clears throat> numerous generations of uh, evangelical churches, which, while they were being dumbed down in uh, the public education system, they were also being generations were also being dumbed down in the new seeker friendly type churches, which reduced their ability to perceive reality, act in reality and function in reality based on a biblical worldview. So the only, I mean, about as heavy as they can get is to say something ridiculous like, what would Jesus do? And why that's a ridiculous question is that it would not be ridiculous if when they asked the question, what would Jesus do, and they were to honestly answer it, what would Jesus really do? And think it through and come up with with, with something that would be an actual Uh, analysis of what Jesus would do instead of a superficial analysis of what Jesus do, which is the product of dumb down thinking. Why is this important? This is important because ideas have consequences. And as as we've said before on the Paul McGuire Report many times, ideas have consequences, good ideas have good consequences, and bad ideas have bad consequences. It is not just political rhetoric. When you hear people say that this election is the most important election and that, and that who we vote for and political economic philosophies that we embrace will literally bring us even, will bring us either hell or heaven for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren. And guess what? God has given us the power. We're not victims in this game. God has given us the power to change the direction of our future. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach fatalism. So, what is the problem here? The problem is twofold. One problem is, is that we have this, we have the super pandemic, which is far greater than the coronavirus pandemic. The super pandemic is the pandemic of brain loss and cognitive decline produced by the media, the mainstream media, by the educational system, and by indoctrination. 
And then furthermore, the super uh, pandemic is a widespread cognitive decline in basic analytical, logical, rational thinking abilities that used to be the norm, that used to be the norm in previous generations. I want to get into this because, as we say on this program, the Paul McGuire Report a lot, knowledge is power. The truth shall set you free. When you don't have knowledge, you're a victim. When you don't have truth, you're a slave. It's that, it's that simple. We'll be back with more in just a moment. This is the Paul McGuire Report. Visit paulmcguire.us. It's paulmcguire.us. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Once again, knowledge is power. If you don't have knowledge, you don't have power. If you don't have power, you're weak. If, you, if you're weak, you're going to get stomped on. I mean, I'm sorry to be so so blatantly in your face, but I learned that as a kid growing up in New York City in Jackson Heights, Queens, which was a middle class neighborhood. But it was also a neighborhood where, you know, in the adjacent neighborhoods, it was the law of the streets. And you found that out <laughs> as a young kid, or I did. Walking to uh, PS 69, which is public grade school 69 in Jackson Heights, Queens. And what I learned, and fortunately I had some buddies, we would, uh, we would hang out together. And their parents were middle class people. Some of their parents and kids went on to be very, very famous people. I'm not in the business of dropping names, so I'll, I'm not going to drop their names, but some of them. Some of them are the most powerful people in the world who came from that middle class environment. But there was also people from bad neighborhoods who would come in. And of all racial groups, okay? And I remember we would like, we would play football, we would play stickball, we would play handball, we would play basketball, we would play baseball. And then, you know, we would walk around to the pizza place, get ourselves a pizza, soda, or whatever. And uh, then we would teach each other to fight. And because some of the kids' fathers, uh, you know, were good at different things. So we kind of mixed martial arts with street fighting, boxing, boxing. And we would wrestle and fight each other in a friendly way. It was very aggressive, but in a friendly way. The idea was... Is to, was to sharpen our skills up in self-defense, which was a good thing in that neighborhood. I remember very innocently walking to school. This pivotal age for me was like what happened in third grade. I always referred to it. I think it, this was third grade. Seems like everything happened in third grade. Um, third grade, I'm walking down the streets to get to the public school 69. And out of the middle of nowhere, I'm, I'm a good kid, okay, and I'll pick on people. Out of the middle of nowhere, these guys are hiding in the bushes, and they jump on me and start to pound me like crazy with their fists, kicking me. Well, that wasn't a great experience. I defended myself. I certainly didn't win the battle, <clears throat> but I defended myself, and they eventually ran off. But I realized. You know, I'm in a jungle, man. And if I don't, you know, I need to really step up my game or, or I'm going to be just like like a, a Twinkie donut thing that somebody stomped on the pavement. So after hanging out with my friends and stuff, I learned to fight. And I learned to fight well, very well, like combat training. And uh, because what everybody knew is if you couldn't fight, you, 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 you were begging to be stomped on. So I remember we were playing basketball together. And this one guy, I, I would get picked on a lot. It's, you know, kind of a wise guy type thing. And I would get picked on a lot. And, uh, but I was taught by my parents to be Light and restrained for the most part. 
with some exceptions from my father. And this guy kept spitting near me, taunting, taunting me while we basketball to, to opposing team. And he did this like, this is the third game he did this, and I warned him to stop it. Well, that means verbally warning a guy who's a lot bigger to stop it means nothing. But, but I tried the appeal approach. That's what most Christians are. They're in that modality in America. It's called getting on your hands and knees and begging for mercy. Let me tell you something. That doesn't work. It never worked in history. And it doesn't work now. If you're if you're if you've gotten yourself into the position that the only the only maneuver you have is to get on your knees and beg for mercy, it's over, man. The battle's over. You already lost it. So this was the third basketball game, and he was getting more intense and spitting probably on his shoes one day, mocking me in front of my friends and stuff. <clears throat> so that was it. I decided that was the end of it. So I walked over to him, slammed him on the pavement, and in about 15, 20, 30 seconds max, I had his face face to the pavement. I didn't hurt him, because again, my love raised me a certain dignity, but I had his face, I had this bully's face smack into the black tar pavement, okay? And then I reached around and pinned both of his arms uh, pushed his arms up, you know, in that position where it's like push their arms up and their face down. You can break their arm. But I wasn't going to break his arm because I wasn't a mean kid. But he was screaming for pain. And I would yank it every once in a while, his arm. Okay? And he would scream in pain. And I was humiliating him in front of his friends. And then I, I didn't do to him next what he would have done to me. Just, just pounded me into, into oblivion. I just yanked his arm a bunch of times where he cried out in pain. Finally, I said, "Do you give?" And he says, "Yes." And I said, "I want you. To, I want you to, to, to make a pledge in front of everybody. You never touch me again. Said, I will never touch you again." And he said, and "Repeat these words." I said, "You will never touch me again. And if you do," If I do, then the hammer is going to come down on me. And I beg you for your forgiveness. A little malicious, but it had to be done. Okay, fine. He resented it, but it was like a dog that was disciplined. He left me alone. He never taunted me after that. But the only language he knew was the language of the street. Now, that, that really wasn't my posture. I wasn't into going around beating people up. because. That's not the way I was raised. But that's the way some people are raised or not raised. And if you, if you can't show restrained force, if you can't stand up to your adversary, they're going to crush you. That's what happened to the Jews in Nazi Germany and the Christian church. When you have a bully, a bully is a totalitarian. Nothing stops a, a bully or a totalitarian other than Superior force. Now, essentially, I'm talking about nonviolent spiritual force, but you also have to have a practical strategy in the physical world to deal with physical realities. That's why we have a police force and need a police force. That's why we have a military and we need a military because there are bad nations in this world. That's just the way it is. And that expression that Donald Trump quoted from Ronald Reagan which was so true, peace through strength. If you want to have peace in your neighborhood or peace on your block, then you need to be able to show strength. And that, that when Ronald Reagan showed strength, <coughs> uh, the Soviet Union backed down, and uh, the, 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 the wall between East Germany and West Germany came down. So in a strategy, when, you're, when you have become the target, you must rise. You can't be a little baby anymore. You know, this, this is not talked about in churches, and it ought to be. And I, you know what? I'm not going to censor myself. We, we have an election. You've got to vote. You've got to pray. You've got to be involved. Okay? Because the other side, 
is involved. They're probably not praying, but that's not true either. Those that are in witchcraft are, are praying to their God. Christians need to be praying to their God with even more intensity. The bottom line is, you have got to ha- you have got to be able. Christians warp the Scripture to a cultural interpretation versus reading the Scripture as it's me- meant to be read, literally and in its plain meaning. And of course, the law of exegesis, which is the law God's law of how you translate His Word, is the the rule of proper translation is that you read the Bible and interpret it as it's pl- as it's read in its plain meaning, unless the text indicates otherwise. So there, the Bible's telling you, the Word of God is teaching you how to interpret the Word of God. And I remember on the other Paul McGuire radio program, Paul McGuire show, where we took lots of callers, uh, and I'm thinking about doing it with this one, maybe, it depends. Uh, but I remember uh, turning the other cheek. We talk about that passage of Scripture. Jesus said, turn, your other che- turn the other cheek. And it's amazing the, the incredible numbers of people that would call up and completely misunderstand what Jesus Christ was talking about when he said, you know, somebody insults you or attacks you, turn the other cheek. They completely uh, misinterpreted or wrongly divided, excuse the English, the word of God, instead of rightly dividing the word of God. When Jesus Christ said, turn the other cheek, that specifically meant in the context of underline, 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 social relationships, you're to turn the other cheek. So if somebody calls you a jerk because you're a Christian, or any uh, a whole spectrum of, of, of toxic behaviors, you're to turn the other cheek as much as possible, and, and to pray for your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Love your enemies. Yeah, love your enemies. Okay, but when you're rightly uh, dividing the Word of God, you don't take that interpretation to an absurd conclusion. And so many evangelical Christians take uh, Jesus' statement that you turn the other cheek and love your enemies, they take it to a non biblical, absurd conclusion where they think it's spiritual to uh, allow somebody to break in their house. Uh, this is not for little children. I'm going to give you an eight-second countdown. So when I finish eight, number eight on a countdown, that means it isn't suitable for young children to hear. Then I'll give you a countdown when it's suitable again going out. Okay, you're warned. This part now, the count to eight, is not suitable. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So. We are discussing live on the air when Jesus said you're, you're to turn the other cheek. And so I would take different callers, had a lot of males call, and many males got it. They interpreted it biblically, that Jesus gave us that commandment from his word to be, that is to be practiced within the environment of social relationships, etc. Okay? But a whole bunch of males called and saying uh, that it's, and I would give the scenario of, of a gang home invasion where they smash down your doors all high on crack or something, and they're going to do God knows what to your wife, and I don't have to be explicit, God knows what to your son or daughter, and then maybe even leave them dead, raped, tortured, dead, right in front of your face. Because I was saying, what should you do as a Christian? And and these guys with a straight face, one after another, would call my program and tell me that they would, that they would, while this was happening, and I would say, you mean, while your wife is being raped, your daughter's being raped, you would stand there and do nothing? And they would say it with kind of a pride. Yes, I'll do nothing. 
I would just trust God, I would just pray, and I would just wait for God to move. So then I would spell out again. So I said, so you're telling me, as this drug-fueled gang of psychopaths smashes down your door, ready to rape, steal, kill, and torture, which is what happens in a gang invasion, you're going to do nothing but just trust God, love love them, uh, you know, love those that despitefully use, use you. You're just going to love them, and you're just going to pray, and you're not going to do anything aggressively or proactively. You're just going to stand there and watch as the unspeakable happens. You all know what that is. Now, go back to anybody can listen. So I'll give you a count of eight. It'll be safe for children. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So that's madness. And I would confront them with it. And then I would go over the thing again, making sure the audience and the caller had a real clear picture of what was going to happen. And that trying to expose that they were right, wrongly dividing the Word of God, and they were essentially going to open the gates of hell in which their loved ones and their family or their wife or whatever would be devoured by an unspeakable force of evil. And they would do nothing. These guys, when I asked them, wouldn't grab a weapon, wouldn't grab a kitchen knife, wouldn't have a gun. You know, they, they would just do nothing but stand there and pray and trust God. And they really believed, from what they were taught, from whatever church they went to, they believed that that was the most, that, the, what, that's what Jesus would do. Now, first of all, Jesus was Jesus. We're not Jesus. Okay? Jesus could blink and call down a hundred angels. And these guys would say stuff, well, I would just sit there and call down the angels. And I'd say, well, what, what if nothing happened? Because you see, along with that goes a false understanding of the spiritual world in connection with the physical world. There's a balance and integration between the spiritual world and the, um, and the uh, physical world. People. And then, then to expose the ludicrousness of, of basically massacring what Jesus was saying, I would play it out again with them in discussion on the air. And I would say, so you're telling me, I said, what would you do if it was raining out really hard and you discovered you had a leak in the roof of your house and water's pouring into your living room and bedroom? Do you just... Uh, Stand there and pray and ask God to supernaturally, if miraculously, heal your roof. People go, no. I said, well, what would you do? They'd say, I, I call some roofing company, roofing repair company, to repair a roof. Yeah. I said, well, why, why wouldn't you just pray to God? And they would mumble and stumble. The reason they were mumbling and stumbling was because um, they were trying. They were trying to take that irrational non-theological truth of just turning the other cheek when it came to the precious sanctity of the lives of their children and wife, and they would do nothing and put them in harm's way, but just pray. Yet when it comes to something of incredibly less value, which is you know, a leak in your roof, then you're willing to do something Pragmatic, like picking up the telephone, making a phone call, and getting your roof fixed. I said, "Why won't you? Why won't you employ that same God-given logic and reasoning regarding uh, the roof leaking as you did to as you did to the home invasion? Why are you operating on two different interpretations of the Bible?" See, it's inconsistent. It's, it's theologically irrational. And then I'd say for Christians to say, well, I don't believe I should vote. And the, the answer is always because, you know, none of the candidates are perfect. And I would remind them, Jesus Christ is not voting. Excuse me, Jesus Christ is not running for election. So you have to vote. It's the best candidate who matches up most closely. With what the Word of God says. 
and they they would give me the same rationale for passivity uh, as they would with the home invasion. But it's all based on being taught uh, a completely inadequate, completely messed up uh, interpretation of the Bible, and that's why. We've come to the place in America, which I've said over and over again on the Paul McGuire Report, we didn't get to this place where people were wearing black masks. I'm not talking about just the coronavirus. I'm talking about the Antifa gangs and other groups which are committing violence in our streets. That didn't come, you know, just overnight. That was planned and thought out methodically by, by, a, a, by people who have been given over to evil for whatever reason. So the point is that unless you have a biblical worldview, and unless you can interpret the scripture properly, you're not going to be proactive, you're not going to be reactive in an intelligent, functional way that works in the real physical world and, and, and also works simultaneously in the spiritual world. In other words, to be blunt, you have not been equipped as a spiritual warrior, as the Apostle Paul commands us to. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and dark, unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. You have to know what's going on in the physical realm and the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, we are, yeah, we're fighting against principalities and powers. But in the physical realm, these Highly trained, highly organized gangs in, in many respects are being financed by billionaires. They're being trained by expert radicals, experts in upheaval and chaos that know how to mobilize and create fear and mass chaos and uh, disrupt a city or a town and occupy it successfully. They've been trained. See, the people on the hard left, the radicals on the left, they have been trained. And their philosophy, and you better understand it, because if you don't understand it, you're going to perish. My people perish for lack of vision. My people perish for lack of wisdom. The, the, the operating philosophy of these radical leftists is by any means necessary. That's their game plan. That's their philosophy. That's their guiding belief system, that they are entitled to do anything. Absolutely anything is justified if it brings forth this communist revolution by any means necessary. Now, we don't think like that, okay? Just like I didn't think like that on the streets of Jackson Heights and had to learn the hard way that you just can't be a nice guy and be polite or you're going to be pounded into the pavement. You've got to learn how to defend yourself physically. So. Christians need to know how to navigate themselves in a real world. And that includes a political world, a physical world, a philosophical world, an economic world. They need to be sharpened up. And they're not sharpened up. And that's why, up until now, we have been losing the culture. But we can turn that around the moment we decide to equip new generations of people, we start to equip ourselves with a proactive plan that is effective in spiritual reality, but also effective in physical reality. Not, not, not the land of make-believe, not the land of we're off to see the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz, which is where most Christians live. It's Christians that should be on the, the aggressive. I'm not talking about in a militant, out-of-control way. I'm talking about in a law-abiding, peaceful way. But they need to have the inner tenacity, the inner confidence in their belief system that will energize them to propel them forward against adversity. They need to be inwardly strong. They need to be built up. That's the purpose of the Paul McGuire Report, this ministry and our message. It's to build people. It's to not only win people to Jesus Christ. It's to build them up spiritually and intellectually and pragmatically, so that they can win the spiritual war. As I said with the title of my new book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. 
The goal is to equip God's people and win souls for Jesus Christ so that they can be energized, be victorious in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. That's the game plan. Not to lose America, not to lose our freedoms, not to lose our children through infiltration by Marxist groups into major denominations, like the infiltration of the Marxist poison called critical race theory, which is nothing more than a ruse for pumping the deception of Marxist communist theory into denominations under the guise of racial reconciliation. It has nothing to do with racial reconciliation. The only person who would believe that is a dumbed-down idiot. It has everything to do with, listen, critical race theory was invented, created, and implemented by communist Marxist professors. Critical race theory has nothing to do with racial reconciliation. Critical race theory has everything to do with Marxist infiltration. Once again, nothing to do with racial reconciliation, everything to do with Marxist infiltration of the denominations, churches, and low bandwidth information Christians. How do you how do you reverse that? You got to expand the bandwidth of low information Christians by communicating to them intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, history, economics, so they have knowledge. Knowledge is power. And that's the purpose of this ministry. That's why I need you to continually join with me in this spiritual battle as an intercessory prayer warrior by uh, helping spread our messages far and wide on the Internet, help us do an end run around censorship, and I need you to stand with us by asking the Lord, Lord, what would you have me give to Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church to help this ministry expand aggressively and effectively in building up God's people and winning people to Christ, cutting through the fog. This ministry is like powerful fog lights cutting through the fog so that we can recapture or reclaim our nation for Jesus Christ. Because the the other side is not going to give up. Just read the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. So I have a story of that in my book. Uh, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. Their goal is to keep this world communist revolution percolating until it it fuses into a globalist, one world communist government, where they artificially reduce the wealth of the working class and middle class in America and other Western nations, and then make all peoples, all the middle class, working class across the world, equally poor like one giant global uh, third world nation where people have no rights, liberties, or freedoms. That is what the globalist elite wants because that's the best way to enslave all of mankind. And the real business that, that they're into, they're not into social justice. If I hear another preacher introduce a sermon and speaking about social justice, positive term, who doesn't know what he talks about, she talks about. They have no idea, they don't know what they're talking about. There is no social justice in communist Marxist nations. Social justice only arises in an environment of freedom, like the United States of America. There you can have social justice, because you have the legal right to protest peacefully, etc., etc. So, I need you to join with me, and I need you to ask the Lord what you can do to help. Because this is the most important spiritual war that you and I have ever faced, and it will determine the direction of the future. But just like physical wars need to be financed, spiritual wars need to be financed. Why? Because it takes money to acquire higher-level social media platforms. Uh, It takes money to acquire new kinds of search engine, video, audio platforms, and to expand it, because you saw them in Congress just last week, sitting there with such incredible arrogance, these heads of these giant tech companies, 
just just boastfully grinning uh, and mocking the make believe politicians who Republicans make believe Republicans, by the way, who pretend to hold them accountable and have no intention of following through, and they have they have created logistics and algorithms and artificial intelligence which censors the entire communications of the internet and social media, censors it into the bias of a radical liberal communist Marxist agenda, and censors out automatically uh, any idea, uh, anything to do with God or Christ or Bible prophecy or capitalism or conservatism. That is like thrown out of the uh, internet universe. And these guys are called on it, and they and they and they mock uh, the politicians that are. You know why they're mocking them? Because these big, big tech giants are not stupid. They know that these Republicans, many of them, are faking holding them accountable because it's election time. But unless we hold these Republicans accountable, nothing's going to change. Because we're in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds in the history of mankind. And the person or the entity or the group that controls the the flow of information controls reality, controls the paradigm, controls the matrix, whatever you want to call it. So while we still have access to the technology, while we can still raise monies, we need to fight the battle to create alternatives. That's what this ministry is all about. That's what our game plan is, to effectively communicate this kind of information, um, which is not being communicated to people through any other medium, or it's not being communicated adequately through any other medium. The person that controls the narrative, just like the word, controls the rhythm of our reality. And right now, the people in the driver's seat are radical humanists, Marxists, socialists, Marxists, and globalists, and people that are just in it for the money, the buck, the power. I'd say probably the the greatest threat are the men, tech giants, and companies, et cetera, internet companies, that in their lust for total power, total domination, total control, they will not only sell out America, they'll sell out their mothers, their grandmothers, their grandchildren. They'll flush the American dream down the toilet so they can accumulate more billions and escape to some private island in some obscenely expensive yacht in their own, with their own security force, with their own cyber defense and their own cyber security forces. and and actual physical security forces. This is the brave new world that we're entering, and we're in a battle in this brave new world. And ultimately, it's a spiritual battle between God and the devil, between the demons and the angels, between those who are following Lucifer and those who are following God. And really, what it comes down to, you will and I will be held accountable as will anybody else who's uh, called by God to proclaim the truth, will be accountable by Jesus Christ. Did we stand up to the plate? Did we respond when God called us to? You need to think about it, and you need to pray for this election like there's no tomorrow, because without prayer involvement in this election and discernment, there will be no tomorrow. And I just, I'm not saying that to frighten anyone or scare anyone, but the scales have to be removed off a lot of people's eyes. Jesus wants to, to heal the eye salve of latency in church, but it needs to be healed. People need to see the obvious. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's a monster <clears throat> glaring at us in the face. <clears throat> we can run <clears throat> in panic, squealing, <clears throat> or we can be proactive and defeat the monster before it defeats us. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. This is Paul McGuire. This is all about defeating the monster before it defeats us. And that comes down to a basic understanding 
of the laws of survival and how to integrate that with biblical truth. In other words, we are faced with the challenge of defeating the monster before it defeats us, but at the same time, we need to balance a biblical worldview and the requirements that Jesus Christ has for us as his people with the realities of spiritual warfare and how it impacts the physical world. And at the same time, we must resist the temptation to become monsters ourselves. This is a delicate balance, and it requires teaching. That's the purpose of the Paul McGuire Report and Paul McGuire Ministries. It's a delicate balance. Now, just as I was sharing with you childhood stories to illustrate a point on how you deal with bullies and how, how to be proactive in defeating bullies, that foundational truth you know, plays out in, in many forms. And it plays out <clears throat> in the reality that we experience right now. We have people and entities and organizations that want to destroy Christianity. They want to destroy the preaching of the gospel. They want to remove Christianity from our culture and nation. And their methodology in doing that is to infiltrate the political process, the the legal process, the educational process, the media process, and weaponizing all of those things against God's people and the Church of Jesus Christ. So, the way to to win is to learn how to defend yourself and learn how to strengthen yourself, as I was sharing with you the story of encountering the bully on the basketball field growing up as a young kid. But we need to have a mentality, we need to have a change in our mentality, And that is reversal of perceiving ourselves as passive victims and allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to transform us into perceiving ourselves as more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Not in a militaristic sense, but in a spiritual sense. But a spiritual sense that's tangible in the physical world. Now, um, and what that means. There has to be a sharpening up of the minds of God's people. Iron sharpens iron. But we got a lot of dull-witted brothers and sisters in Christ out there, and they aren't sharpening anybody. Iron sharpens iron. That's one of the purposes of Paul McGuire Ministries. Iron sharpens iron. And the goal is, is to expose people's minds to the, to the sharp blade of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the only way that happens is if you're communicating and talking to people who have inadvertently perhaps surrendered their minds to a kind of pervasive dullness. In other words, they're, they're, they're wielding, they think they're wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But they're not. They might as well be wielding uh, a cardboard empty roll of toilet paper. And that's not going to defeat a, a real sword. So there, there has to be, in, in their developmental educational process spiritually, when they rightly divide the Word of God, that educational process, if it's biblical, has to be, you have to be in, in proximity. You have to be being influenced by people who know how to wield the sword of the Spirit with an expertise, but their swords are are very, very sharp. They're not dull. So when there's a clash between the dull sword of the Spirit and the true biblical sword of the Spirit, the sharp, the impact of the sharp sword of the Spirit um, sharpens the dull-witted blade. It's kind of like if you've ever had to sharpen a knife, either with a non-electrical device that sharpens knives, or an electrical device that sharpens knives. The basic principle is you put the knife through this slit or something and slide it against a metal that's uh, 
scrapes off the dullness of a blade that's gone dull. When you buy a knife set, assuming you didn't buy a set of knives that are just junk, but if you buy a knife set of halfway decent knives, what usually happens, you use the knife to cut all kinds of things or cook or prepare food. But after a short period of time, that knife loses its ability to cut food, uh, to, to chop carrots, tomatoes, potatoes, whatever, cut meat, whatever. That knife loses its ability to cut with precision because it's now a dull knife just through repeated usage. So if you will sharpen the knife on a regular basis through, through a knife sharpener or another instrument, then you will take your knife, which has become dull-bladed and somewhat useless, and also dull knives are far more dangerous than sharp knives because dull knives are unpredictable. Sharp knives are predictable. They're going to cut. Dull knife is saying you got to you got to press harder. You got to press harder, and the next thing you know, you're you're whacking through your finger because it it moves from being dull and catches something, and then it moves through a substance with velocity, and it's very dangerous. So, iron sharpens iron. The idea is to be in an environment spiritually. Where you're, if you're around dull-witted Christians, I'm talking about biblically dull-witted Christians, then you're going to be a dull-witted Christian. A dull-witted Christian is essentially useless in a spiritual battle. Because you're not even holding a spiritual weapon. You might as well be just fighting the enemy off with an electric toothbrush where the battery's dead. You're kind of a, the clown. I mean, I'm serious. So God doesn't want that. You know, the same message that God is giving us about iron sharpens iron, you submit to a spiritual authority or a teacher or a preacher who, when you're exposed to the truth that that that, that individual is delivering to you from the Word of God, you're supposed to come away with iron sharpening iron. You're supposed to come away with a sword of the Spirit that's sharpened and intact. If you're coming away from that encounter with a dull blade, you're contributing to the problem. Because a dull blade is useless in, in battle, and it's useless in uh, preparing food. It's, it's, it's worthless. Now notice that this same truth the Bible reiterates in numerous places. Iron sharpens iron. And Jesus Christ talks about the fact that the, church, the true church of Jesus Christ is like salt. It only takes a little itsy bit of salt to flavor, you know, an entire meal. But Jesus warns that when the salt church has lost its savor, salt has lost its potency, then you sprinkle it on food, and it's like you put little pieces of cardboard on food. It has done nothing. And what does he say? That salt for the church has lost its savior. It's lost its ability to give taste to the food, and therefore it has become useful. And the only thing it's good for is trampling on with your foot. So you throw it on the ground in the dirt, and you trample it on on it with your foot because it's it, it, salt has lost its saltiness. Okay, so Jesus Christ is circling around again and teaching us the same truth with different descriptive terms. And then we'll see Jesus Christ, or the Word of God, circles around over and over again, giving us the same truth with different descriptions, because this truth is so imperative. Salt, that's lost its savor. Um, iron sharpens iron. Um, and many other passages of Scripture, where it talks about Intensity. You see, Jesus Christ is all about a focus of Holy Spirit energy and intensity. Intensity. If your Christian life lacks intensity, then you lack Holy Spirit power. You are a dull bladed sword. You're the salt that lost its savor. 
Jesus Christ is all about intensity and equipping you to be victorious in the battle. It's not a game. You understand what I'm saying? This is not a game. What we're doing in this ministry is not a game. What your life is about is not a game. You already know that. This is not a game. And so when we read Revelation, um, once again, Revelation chapter 3, when Jesus talks to the lukewarm church, which is the church of the the Laodiceans, I'll read you what what Jesus Christ says to the church of the Laodiceans. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Once again, this is about intensity. Okay? Jesus is repulsed by the church when it is neither cold nor hot. It's in that wishy-washy, dull-bladed, salt that's lost its savor, zone, or it's lukewarm, okay? Most of the evangelical church is lukewarm. It has no intensity. And therefore, Jesus says, I'm going to vomit that church, the lukewarm church, out of my mouth. Why? Because it has no intensity. And when the church has no intensity, it has no ability to save souls. It has no ability to bring about revival. It has no ability to do anything. The church that has lost its its ability to be hot or cold, and it just wants to be in the stagnation position of lukewarmness, is useless. That's why he, he says, I'll vomit it out of, out of my mouth. Or salt that's lost its saltiness. Is, is the only thing you can do with it is trample it on the ground, throw it out. Okay? Verse 17, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. They're deceived. Do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And then finally he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye cell that you may see. Okay, another characteristic of not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, not being uh, hot or cold, but being lukewarm, is a symptom of that. Okay, just like there's symptoms to COVID, there's symptoms to a lack of being on fire among Christians. There's a symptom to being a lukewarm Christian. And here's one of the primary symptoms. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. You're, you're, you're in spiritual deception over just how pathetic your spiritual condition is. You, you cannot any longer see how, how degraded your spiritual condition is. And so you should be ashamed and come to God in repentance. Why? Because Jesus says he wants to anoint your eyes with eye salve, eye medication, produced by the Holy Spirit, that you may see. So you see, the end product of being a lukewarm Christian is you're blinded from seeing the true nature of reality. And the reason you're blinded from seeing the true nature of reality is you have pulled away from your power source, Jesus Christ. And therefore, you're going to lose the spiritual battle because you have no power, you have no intensity, you have no passion, you have no fire, you have no wisdom, you have a dull sword of the Spirit. This, all of these things can get you killed on the battlefield. And you and I are called to be revitalized. That's why I urge you to go to paulmcguire.us and take advantage of all the free resources we have for you. We can expect that very soon, perhaps starting today, we're going to see the beginning of riots, demonstrations, accusations. Accusations of missing ballots, a- accusations of, of people stealing and hiding the ballots, accusations of criminality regarding the integrity of the uh, voting process. We're going to see a war erupt. No matter who wins this election, we're going to see a war erupt, a struggle for power. 
and you're going to see accusations and lies and ballots found and electronic stuff. It's going to be an all-out war. Why? Because you have to remember that the working philosophy of many people that are attempting to rig this election, they, their, their philosophy is not about integrity or truth or honesty or virtue. Their philosophy is, quote, by any means necessary. They self-justify any action, any behavior, any illegality, any criminality is totally justified if it furthers their so-called revolution. That's exactly what a communist revolution or a Marxist or socialist revolution is all about. And we're right smack in the middle of one. And God's people need to be prepared in today the upcoming days, weeks, months, however long it lasts. However long it lasts, God's people need to be vigilant. They need to have their blades sharpened. They need to have their spiritual vision restored. And what on earth are you doing in a dull-bladed, dull-witted church surrounded by dull-witted Christians who are clueless? What good are you to the kingdom of God? You say, that's me. Is it mean, or am I merely reiterating the words of Jesus Christ when he said, when the salt has lost its ability to make the food salty, the only good of salt that's lost its savor is to throw it on the ground because it's useless and trample it. Jesus Christ said, when you're a lukewarm Christian, you have allowed yourself to become spiritually blind. Well, you're pretty useless in the battle, aren't you? unless you allow Jesus Christ through the eye salve of the Holy Spirit to heal your ability to see spiritually. Otherwise, you're going to be massacred on the battlefield. And you better have a iron sharpens iron spiritual sword, sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, that's really sharp, or you too will be taken down on the battlefield, both spiritual and physical. You need to be prepared to endure hardship and adversity with an effective strategy over a long period of time. Because let me tell you, what you're seeing starting to happen already, starting to happen even today, you can expect, based on previous behavior patterns, that this war for who will control and who will rule the future, this nation, is going to be determined by the person or group or groups of people who are most committed to their cause. It's not enough just to have the truth on your side. If you believe that you're going to win the war just because you have the truth on your side, you must be on a, on a narcotic. Because victory doesn't go to the person just because they have truth on your so on your side. You have to be as committed to fighting for the truth. You have, be, you have to be as committed to fighting for the truth, enduring adversity, having endurance, not taking no for an answer, having perseverance, and regularly submitting to the power of God's Word and the energizing force of the Holy Spirit. You have got to be in the game 100%. And you need to uh, exhort and influence those people around you to be in the game 100%. The battle of our nation <clears throat> has just begun. It actually began a long time ago. But it's going to accelerate. You should have no mythology about what our reality is going to be collectively. We are about to enter a struggle of unprecedented proportions in our nation and around the world, driven by globalist forces who, who like, like parasitical octopuses, are like psychic vampires sucking the energy out of virtuous, good people. <clears throat> we are waging war, my friends, against the demons of hell, ultimately. Ultimately, we're not fighting, as, as Paul said, the Apostle Paul, ultimately, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the principalities, the powers, the dark, unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Ultimately, we are fighting not people, but we're fighting demonic powers and demonically energized institutions and groups of people. 
And if we cannot fight against the demonic powers with the same intensity and more, and, and actually more intensity than they wage against us, <clears throat> then we're in disobedience to the commandment of our Lord <clears throat> and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we continue on with faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We continue in faith anchored in who Jesus Christ is. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Our job is to occupy until he comes. Our job is to preach the gospel and win souls until he comes. Our job is to make disciples of all nations. And that means we do everything in our power that we possibly can in the strength and anointing of the Holy Spirit and believe in our hearts by faith in Christ that when we put our faith in Christ, we are well able to take the land. And when we perceive the giants, we perceive the giants as little tiny grasshoppers. And that changes the perception of the giants. They begin, begin to see themselves as grasshoppers. And they have a paradigm change. And they see themselves, they see us as giants. And thus we take the land. Read the story of Joshua and Caleb. When God commanded them to go into Canaan, which is. Uh, the land of promise for, for Israel. So, we've been called for such a time as this. You're not here by accident. Now we have to obey. We have to be faithful in season and out of season. And so, you are to obey. I am to obey what? Whatever God puts on our heart to do, and whatever God puts before us to do. When we know it's the Lord, when we've taken the time to seek the Lord and commit our ways to the Lord, then we obediently follow his guidance and his leadership. I need you at this time more than ever. He's talking about platforms. We need to raise substantial income, substantial monies to acquire new social media platforms to do an end run around the evil big tech giants and the evil internet search engine uh, technologies. We need to have new technologies. We, ne- we need to be able to pay for new technologies that will allow us to continually reach people effectively. And we cannot, we absolutely cannot allow people who have poised their hearts to destroy us in the gospel to defeat us over the issue of money. So I'm exhorting you to pray for us, stand with us, pray for me, my family, this ministry help spread the message far and wide, and ask the Lord how you can contribute to this spiritual battle and what he wants you to do in terms of your gifts and contributions, what he wants you to do in terms of this battle for the future of America. Right now, we're, we're just in the initial phases of a, of a, of a social disruption, of a battle uh, on all s- uh, spectrums of society. There is going to be lies manipulation, rumors, scandals, lawsuits, all kinds of things, accusations of uh, rigging the ballots, all kinds of things. There's going to be chaos and confusion because it was pre-planned. It was pre-engineered. We have to be able to defeat this. And the only way we can defeat this is by recognizing it, it is that ultimately we're not fighting against people or human institutions, or individuals. We are fighting against principalities and powers and the dark, unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. If you wake up one day and we're not available on this platform, you need to remember paulmcguire.us. You need to remember brideon.com, brideon.com, Paul McGuire Ministries. You need to know all the other channels and platforms we're on and the new ones we're in the process of acquiring as our faithful partners donate and contribute the money we need to be able to purchase these platforms. We're not going away. We're just moving our location, as will be many other people. They, they want to stomp us out. But let's get real. They want to stomp you out. But if we have the new platforms, like Brighteon.com, uh, PaulMcGuire.us, and others. We need to be able to purchase those platforms 
so we're not vulnerable to be taken down. This is an information war. So visit paulmcguire.us, and I encourage you to do those simple things about always knowing where we are. Don't snooze. Corny old expression, but it's true. Snooze, you lose. The other side is vicious. These tech giants, without any justification, they don't give a hoot. They'll take anybody down for anything. It's like they're kings and queens of their own universes. That is not freedom of religion, and that is not freedom of speech. But freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of the press are only as good as to the degree that the people who are enjoying those freedoms will actually stand up for them. God bless you. This is your brother in Christ, Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. Pray. Today's a heavy day spiritually, man. It's a heavy day practically. Pray. We are fighting an incredible battle, and it's raging today. It's raging today. Your prayers could actually make the difference between victory and defeat. So pray and do what God has called you to do on this day and every other day. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us.